Next slide. Uh, the, the structure of uh, today's webinars is that we will focus on more P's. So we will speak about prevention, protection and prosecution. And then we will have uh, some uh, inspiring practices presented by our guest speakers. So you will see here the, the program of the day and uh, oops, sorry. I changed several slides. Uh, the program of today. Uh, so we'll start with the prevention. We'll move on protection and then prosecution, the inspiring practices, and then we will have time for the Q and A. Again, I'm saying that you can type any questions that you may have in the chat box. Thank you very much, and uh, I will give the floor to my colleague Panayota. Uh, I didn't introduce myself because I was speaking from the beginning. So my name is Vasa Madesi. I'm working as a consultant. And with my colleague, Panayota, we will present uh, today's webinar. Panayota, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you, Vasya. Hi, everyone. Uh, so as noted, we start with prevention. So starting with prevention. Prevention refers to measures that aim prevent incidents of gender-based violence from, ha from happening in the first place. So this involves promoting changes in the way people think and act so that everyone in the academic community can feel safe and respected. Now, in the context of academia, prevention can take different forms. A code of conduct, for example, is a common practice. A clear code of conduct is a set of rules guidelines lay out the expected behaviors of the members of the organization. Now, another prevention measure could be the communication and uh, materials for both existing and newcomers, uh, staff and students, about the forms of gender-based violence. Ongoing awareness raising campaigns and training programs are also common, are also common practices. And awareness raising campaigns help the victim to acknowledge what gender-based violence is and what are its forms. One of the common reasons why victims uh, not report their incidents, as we've seen in the last webinar from UNICEF's uh, survey uh, results, is the fact that victims were not aware of what gender-based violence is. Therefore, um, efficient awareness raising campaigns are highly, highly important. Now, how, how to approach prevention? Uh, firstly, it's important to mention that we need to make sure that um, you provide permanent information on your commitment against gender-based violence. By doing so, you are actively demonstrating your dedication to creating a safe and inclusive environment for all students, uh, staff and faculty. Awareness raising campaigns can, ta can take many forms such as social media campaigns, or workshops, seminars, events dedicated to a topic, perhaps internal radio and TV broadcasts and competitions and many more. Various channels can be utilized for the promotion of the campaigns, such as posters, uh, leaflets, uh, social media posts, uh, videos, uh, newsletters, or any other form of internal communication tool. Therefore, make sure you offer a variety of campaigns if possible and utilize various channels. An example of awareness raising campaign um, is the campaign of the Danish Working Environment Authority named Where Do We Draw the Line? It's a short film that describing sexual harassment and offers dialogue cards that can be used as a game that presents different situations where players must decide how to respond. This could be included, for example, as part of an awareness raising campaign at a university or research performing organization. Um, in, in, the, in the context of training programs and awareness raising campaigns. Now, in addition to outlining the commitment, institutions should also provide information on the process of making uh, a complaint and ensure that safe channels are in place for individuals to report incidents of gender-based violence. Providing permanent information and a safe channel uh, to complain is a crucial, it's crucial because it helps in creating a culture of accountability and transparency where gender-based violence is not tolerated and victims and, supporter, and survivors are, are supported. Now, the commitment against gender-based violence and a campaign in, ge in general are more likely to be effective when there is a clear communication strategy established. You may find the step-by-step -step guide designed by UNICEF on how to build an awareness raising campaign on uh, UNICEF's website that we can also share with you after this webinar. 
Um, training programs and empowerment of bystanders is another prevention measure, highly, highly suggested. Educational programs and trainings aim to um, provide the community with information about the policies of the institution, the procedures, reporting options, but also available resources and services. Training uh, serves as an opportunity for the staff and students to ask questions, to clarify policies, and engage in an open dialogue about the issue. So as a result, training can increase uh, the confidence of, of uh, the community and the, tr and tr and the trust in supporting, uh, uh, in, in, in trusting the institution in reporting incidents and creating a more supporting and informed community. Now, a thorough uh, educational program should at very least guarantee that the participants, students and staff members are informed about the definition of gender-based violence and what and, and its forms to understand um, the power imbalances and how they contribute to violence to, to help them recognize of warning signs and behaviors that may indicate a risk of violence, but also it's an opportunity to review uh, the, the organizational policies and procedures, but also the relevant uh, laws and legal protection uh, for victims and perpetrators. Techniques for bystander intervention can also be part of this educational program. And any discussion about the impact of violence on, on individuals, on the team, of the organization are suggested. And of course, skills for promoting a culture of respect and equality in the workplace can be part of such educational program. Now, uh, bystander intervention uh, refers to the actions taken by individuals who observe a potential harmful situation. The purpose is to prevent further violence from occurring, and a bystander intervention training program offers education and training to staff and students on recognizing those signs and on developing intervention skills and, and, and provide guidelines, clear guidelines for them uh, for intervening or reporting incidents, uh, including uh, support for those who intervene. Now, moving to some tips and hints uh, on prevention. As previously mentioned, communication departments are key stakeholders for the implementation of a prevention strategy. Such strategy can be embedded to the institutional communication strategy that will support the institutionalization of prevention measures, Therefore, make sure you engage the communication department in the design and implementation process. In order to reach the broadest possible audience, you can share information on activities and training opportunities through multiple channels. channels. The institution's main channels, such as the website, the official social media pages, uh, et cetera, are important to be used. I'm sorry, I have been muted. Uh, okay, moving on. Now, in order to hold uh, perpetrators accountable, ensure that faculty, uh, staff, students, and institutional and foreign services in general are aware of the gender-based policies, uh, gender-based uh, violence, excuse me, policies, or code of conducts and procedures and all possible sanctions that uh, exist in the universe, in, in, the, in, the, in the institution, as previously mentioned. When providing information about uh, hotline support services or reporting procedures on the website of the institution, make sure that this information are, are, uh, is as accessible as possible for the user. Avoid adding those information under um, subcategories or hidden under specific pages, departments, or offices, as they need to be as easily accessible in case of an emergency. Newcomers, staff, and students are an important target group to design specific materials uh, related to the forms of gender-based violence. Therefore, make sure you design actions uh, tailor-made for that audience. A good practice is also to build allies by identifying individuals, either students or staff, who are committed to preventing gender-based violence and who are willing to be part of a prevention working group responsible perhaps for the design and the implementation of the practices and activities. Now, building actions specifically to top management uh, leadership, uh, the dean's uh, head of department is another good practice because it points out their role and their responsibility 
in securing safe working and study environments. Resources, alloca resources allocation has to be sufficient in order to maintain the sustainability of the practices. And lastly, monitor and evaluation systems has to be in place to assess the components of the prevention program and ensure that it remains relevant and effective. Now, how does intersectionality uh, can be taken into consideration when designing prevention measures? As a first step, when designing a preventative measure, consider the different ways in which intersectional identities impact the definition, the recognition, but also the response to incidents of gender-based gender violence to different groups. When offering trainings, you can um, highlight the experiences of marginalized communities, as well also in, when designing campaigns. Uh, you can provide targeted support and resources for staff and students with intersecting identities, and this could be this could be offered in different language, uh, languages uh, or awareness raising campaigns in different formats, such as uh, braille writing system or different languages. Make sure you engage with uh, staff and students with diverse background that they can act uh, as experts or informants during the design of a training program or a campaign and gather their feedback and, and comments uh, by developing participatory process in which these um, groups are involved. We highlight um, their involvement and in the importance of, 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 ha here, of having their uh, perspective in our training materials and awareness raising campaigns. Lastly, we can also offer training on the notion of privilege with an intersectional approach. Prevention is also about training the staff and students about the accepted behaviors and recognition that gender-based violence affects some groups more than others. Now, having said that, we can move to the next P of the 7P framework, which is protection. So going back to Vasya and changing the slide. Thank you, Panayota. Uh, so what do we mean by protection and uh, where do we start with uh, protection? Protection comes uh, even though we have preventive measures when an incident occur in order to um, ensure the safety of uh, individuals inside our institutions. So that means that we need to establish clear procedures and also infrastructure in order people know uh, how to report an incident and uh, uh, that uh, they feel that they are supported um, when reporting a gender-based violence incident. This uh, includes measures about uh, victims, survivors, bystanders, whistleblowers and uh, intermediaries and so on. So what is uh, protection? What we mean when we use that term? It means uh, that we should be able as an institution to provide immediate safety and uh, safe spaces for victim survivors. It means that we need to provide emergency accommodation, also clear information and uh, support on how to report and uh, what are the reporting uh, procedures and the possibilities? Can we report informally, formally, and what that means, all the different steps? And protection against retaliations and dismissal for people who report, that people feel hurt. Uh, also, uh, inside the protection P, we need to assess the risks of uh, gender-based violence incidents, to avoid more incidents to occur and to identify any potential patterns inside our institution. Now, um, I'm trying to change the slide. Okay. Now, the protection measures uh, should be taken in order to cover all the types of harmful behaviors. And uh, as soon as an incident, is reported, uh, even if there is no formal complaint um, or in any case of an anonymous reporting, we need to ensure that we can protect uh, the individuals in our community. Uh, 
So uh, that means that protection should be offered not only what we think inside a campus uh, or in the premises of an institution, but also in online setting during a student event, a conference, uh, or um, maybe a field trip outside the campus. So it can also uh, happen, an incident can happen outside the campus, uh, such as during conferences or field research activities. And we need to have protective measures even in these situations that we don't always think um, when we um, speak about gender-based violence. So now, uh, moving on on some tips and uh, hints for protection. Uh, you should remember that uh, uh, we, as an institution, we should provide a range of potential solutions to our victim survivors or the whistleblowers or the person that it is reporting. Um, the protection measures, of course, are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, we need to take into the uh, into account uh, what has happened, uh, the specific requirements of one situation. But we should have a full set of potential solutions. Regarding the reporting procedure, we need to ensure that we have effective reporting uh, provisions that are in place, and uh, that they can the institution can provide the protection that it's needed. This uh, means uh, that we can consider having different options for reporting. Um, a person can report in person or online. Uh, they can do it anonymously or not anonymously. They can do it in a formal or informal setting in different languages as well, in order to ensure that all the members of the community are equally heard. And uh, also the reporting system should be accessible 24 hours a day and seven days uh, a week. Also, this means that the protection measures um, will be accessible 24 hours. Uh, also, we need to give the possibility to report to the institutions uh, when we are speaking about mobile researchers, mobile students, people that are outside the premises in the field trip and so on. The next um, slide, a few more uh, tips and hints. Um, here, we need to think of who can provide uh, the protection. So protection can be provided either by a specific contact point or a person in uh, its faculty for students or, or staff. It, uh, it depends on the case. Um, from a dedicated service, uh, for example, this could be um, a human resources um, officer for staff or for students, or uh, to an emergency warden or security officer. We need to think of all possible contact persons, whether specifically designated to deal with gender-based violence or to act in uh, emergencies as first responders. For example, the security personnel can also act as protection persons, and as contact points. Uh, but these, it, it is important to have um, given specific training to the contact persons. So they are understanding all the different forms of violence and, uh, and their continuum. So um, they need to provide trauma-informed care. Uh, they need to empathize with uh, the victim or the person that it is reporting and also practice active uh, listening without judging and without um, giving any further burden to uh, the person that it is reporting. Some more uh, tips and hints on protection. Let's go back one slide. I think we skipped one slide. Okay. In order to give um, to the, the persons, the victims, a sense of safety um, and uh, protections, um, in order to reduce their fear to reprisal, we need to have settings and procedures that allow an immediate response from our institution. 
uh, we need to act uh, before there is um, any uh, escalation. Also, uh, we need to establish an accessible and transparent procedure for handling the incidents and complaints at an uh, early stage. So we need to encourage reporting by providing complete information on uh, the possible sanctions against the perpetrators um, and also to give uh, a clear signal of the importance and also the value of reporting all the incidents. Also, uh, we need to avoid procedures that require uh, the manager or supervisor to be contacted first. So this um, complements what we say about clear uh, procedures and also uh, the contact persons, uh, the first contact persons need to be um, educated and trained. Uh, in order to, um, to offer support. We need to be always um, supportive. Uh, we, need, we, we don't need to uh, ignore, minimize or downplay any uh, incident. And um, also there is a, a practice that uh, people uh, warn for uh, that false allegations are punishable under criminal law. This may discourage uh, a victim by officially reporting uh, one incident. So we need to be careful when using uh, these uh, type of uh, ter uh, terms in order not to discourage uh, victims from speaking up. So now uh, we need also to ensure that we are protecting uh, the, the, total, the totality of the community. So uh, in this case, and when we're speaking about mobile researchers, it is a good practice to uh, foresee emergency funding to allow traveling expenses in incidents that occur during the field trips and conferences so that the person uh, can travel back to its origin uh, institution uh, or end country location. And also when it comes to online violence, we need to be careful about social networks and uh, online teaching and emails. We know that online spaces, because uh, they have sometimes anonymity, uh, can be uh, very harmful. So we need to um, flag incidents and um, make sure that the system is easily accessible and known to all on how to get support in the case of uh, an online uh, violence incident. And um, as we said, um, we are also taking care of intersectional aspect, aspects. So how we can consider intersectionality in uh, the protection measures. So in order to be responsive to intersectional gender-based violence, we need to meet the needs of groups uh, that experience multiple and intersecting inequalities and uh, discrimination. We need to contact risk assessments in advance to understand uh, what are the risks faced by the LGBTQI community, for example, in staff and students. This is just an example, um, but we need to think of the different communities existing inside our institutions and assessing. Also, uh, the contact persons and the services that are providing uh, protection measures need to be culturally responsive and respectful. So in order to do that, we need to have specific training. And uh, lastly, when it is uh, possible to establish uh, a diverse group of contact persons in terms of gender, background, origin, and so on, because this will make the reporting parties who are, who are coming from minority groups to be more comfortable when reporting an incident. They could feel that they are somehow represented and heard. And finally, supportive and protected. So we can, this being said, we can move on the prosecution, which is the last P we will present today. And I give the floor back to my colleague, Panagiotta. Yes, thank you, Masia. So moving on to the last P presented today, as mentioned, prosecution. Now, in the context, again, of academia, 
Prosecution refers specifically to internal disciplinary measures against alleged perpetrators, related investigative measures and sanctions. In some cases, it may also involve judicial proceedings, including court cases, criminal and civil offenses. When working on prosecution practices, we need to have in mind that our primary focus is our victims. So a victim-centered and gender-responsive approach is necessary. Clear, accessible, and transparent procedures for handling incidents and complaints are important to be in place, and there should be a reasonable time, timeline between complaints, investigation, this, or, and decision and, or sanctions. So similarly to protection, training should be offered to those involved in the, in, in the procedure to make sure they're aware of how they handle cases uh, of gender-based violence. When working on prosecution, we need to make sure that a continuous communication exists about the process of prosecution and is established with the um, survivor victims, perpetrators, bystanders along the different steps of prosecution. Uh, investigation measures and the burden of proof should be applied on the person who brings uh, a claim in a dispute, and specific disciplinary procedures should be, should be set for staff and students. Um, as previously mentioned, the composition of the investigation and disciplinary committee or any other committee related to the processes should be composed of, of trained people representing the different stakeholders. For example, uh, representatives of uh, the leadership, uh, representatives from the students' community or trade unions, and uh, the gender balanced um, approach will be also taken uh, in mind. Take, uh, taken in mind. Lastly, remember that uh, different types of sanctions should apply for different forms of violence. Something that we're going to revisit again later. Uh, sexual and gender based violence in general are notoriously difficult to investigate and prosecute. So the various legal contexts applicable to research organizations in Europe and the variety of situations in which offenses occur require, requires flexibility in the investigative approach and sanctions. Therefore, key principles applying are victim-centered approach, as we mentioned, and a recognition of the specificities of gender-based violence, as mentioned before. So. Having said that, a clear prosecution strategy should be in place that is known by everyone, by staff and students. The code of contact was previously mentioned in prevention. The code of contact should be always accompanied by a protocol that sets out the procedures in case of the violation of the code of contact. Having a clear information of what can serve as an evidence according to the different forms of gender by based violence is highly um, important to be communicated um, within the community, but also with the victims in case of a report of an incident. Informal and formal disciplinary uh, procedures, excuse me, uh, should be clearly set out and be established, including the types of disciplinary actions or sanctions. For example, verbal or written warnings, suspension, dismissal, uh, perpetrator, treatment or counseling or ongoing supervision. Uh, we need to avoid setting a fixed time limits for when a complaint can be made. It is important to acknowledge and recognize that cases of sexual harassment and violence may have occurred years ago, and it may take time before a victim or survivor is ready to report it. By providing clear and reasonable timeframes to each stage of the uh, complaint procedures um, is a practice that also promotes trust, transparency, and accountability within the community. The, the complainant and the accused both have the right to be represented by a trade union, a lawyer, or a friend. Therefore, we need to acknowledge that during the procedure. And um, another good uh, suggestion and practice is to avoid having joint meetings to clarify the situation with both parties or having external mediation and, or, and conciliation procedures between the parties. 
by make by providing regular feedback on the process of, of to the person who comp who complained is uh, an important um, practice that also promotes a, a, um, a sense of safety and security for for the victim. Now, when addressing the investigation measures, we need to remember that an investigation can start only when a formal complaint is made. Informal or anonymous complaints are used to assess the situation, to identify patterns inside the institution, and to assess the context and the behavior of the perpetrator and to take protective and preventing measures. We need to make sure that there is a clear process for conducting independent internal or external investigations. And if there is an internal committee, as we mentioned before, the composition should be diverse to ensure that the point of view of the victim is reflected as previously mentioned by Basia. For example, if a student, a student will be a member of that committee if the victim is a student. Uh, having external members in such committee is a good practice, but we also need to have in mind to avoid conflict of interest in the composition of investigation or disciplinary committee, especially when the accused is a member of staff. The investigators of the, case, of the cases have to be trained to understand gender-based violence and to carry out investigations in a gender-responsive way by understanding trauma and its impact on the way abuse is reported. Now, as far as possible, the reporting of, of investigation should protect the anonymity of, vit of victims and witnesses. And lastly, investigation should continue even if the victim or perpetrator has resigned, as the, the institution uh, may uh, learn important lessons about underlying root causes, casual factors, um, et cetera. Causal factors, excuse me, uh, et cetera. Now, uh, uh, reviewing now the disciplinary measures. The disciplinary uh, process should be specific to gender-based violence and not follow general disciplinary rules and procedures. Gender-based violence should not be dealt with in the same way as, for example, plagiarism for students is, is addressed. The main idea behind disciplinary action is to correct behavior, which does not necessarily involve sanctions. Of course, this is not valid. Uh, for severe forms of gender-based violence. Correction of behavior cannot be valid in such cases. There should be, however, a progressive disciplinary rationale in place, and this requires that disciplinary interventions are always documented. Depending on the nature and severity of the misconduct, it may be appropriate to use um, constructive measures and sanctions, particularly, particularly for milder uh, offenses. Formal disciplinary measures may include verbal or written warnings, as we mentioned before, training, suspension, dismissal, uh, counseling, or ongoing supervisions. And lastly, member, remember that the institution should avoid uh, imitating judicial processes, such as conducting hearings, and should also understand that the standard of uh, evidence beyond reasonable doubt does not mean proof beyond any possible doubt. To ensure now that um, victims, uh, to ensure trust of victims survivors, it is also essential to that the, the findings and recommendations of the investigation committee are fully acted upon. And the ability to impose sanctions on the perpetrator regardless of, of status is essential. Sanctions uh, um, are depending on the power relations relationship between the two sides. And the greater the power difference, the stronger the sanction for perpetrators. Sanctions should be communicated to the victim and survivor and bystanders, as we mentioned before, in a, in a reasonable time frame. And it is important to know that internal prosecution should be independent of the victim survivor's decision to report the incident to the police or to the judicial authorities. Uh, and some tips and hints on prosecution. The creation of uh, a specific external body uh, for investigating incident can be shared with other similar institutions in the region or country, particularly for small institutions that cannot have their own specific investigating body. So make it clear to the management that 
being afraid of potential pursuit by the perpetrator is not a valid argument. This is something really um, common uh, being said from top management because victims can also sue the institution for inaction. Also, monitoring of investigations and sanctions will demonstrate that there is a consistent approach to holding perpetrators accountable, it, that high value scholars or senior managers are not protected or given special treatment. To ensure that uh, the perpetrator does not reoffend elsewhere, you may consider recording severe forms of, of tra transgressive behaviors as re research misconduct. Research misconduct is public information that follows the perpetrator and is communicated widely. Lastly, ensure that uh, the victim is not required to provide answers or being interviewed more than once by the investigator, uh, by the investigator committee or other people involved in the process. Uh, in this way, we avoid revictimization. And this should be our priority. And similarly, we need to ensure that victims are not required to give their testimony in the presence of their perpetrator. And the last point is that no one should be asked to sign a confidentiality or non-disclosure agreement as part uh, of the resolution of a complaint. Moving to the last part of, of persecution, how do we think intersectionally? We need to ensure that an intersectional approach of anti-discrimination policies uh, is taken at every stage of the process and whenever possible, investigation and prosecution committees are diverse and include experts in intersectional or multiple forms of violence, as we mentioned. We need to ensure that all campus law and for enforcement and public safety officers uh, receive ongoing uh, and up-to-date training on the dynamics of gender-based violence, including the impact of uh, trauma on victims of sexual assault, uh, domestic violence, stalking, and gender-based violence in general. And lastly, sanctions should consider multiple and intersectional discrimination um, in, in their processes. Now, having said that, we now conclude the presentation of the th three piece presented today. And we move to the last uh, uh, the last part of our webinar, the inspiring practice and experience exchange. I'm giving the floor back to Vasya to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Panayota. We have uh, provided very rich content so far. Uh, so today with us, we have uh, Rachel Payne and Christy Waller, both coming from the Oxford Brookes University to present the Sexual Consent Education uh, uh, Project. Um, so, um, OBU, Oxford Brookes University, is also one of the partners of UNICEF uh, Project. We will have with us today uh, Rachel, who is a principal lecturer uh, in education and student experience at Oxford Brookes. And in this capacity, she leads the Sexual Consent Education Project, which she co-created with Christy Waller in 2018-19. to 19. Uh, Christy Waller's background is in youth and community work. And prior to working with Oxford Brookes University, she was delivering consent workshops in youth clubs and, and some festivals. She's currently working for a national domestic abuse charity supporting children and young people with lived experience who want to use their expertise to influence uh, policy change and to develop best practices. And she has been working with Oxford Brookes University as an external consultant since 2018. So thank you both uh, for uh, being here with us today. And um, I give you the floor. Thank you. Uh, can I share my slides? Yes, please. Uh, okay, hello everybody. It's really great to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, well, Vasya, you gave us a really great introduction, so I don't really need to say, oh, sorry. I don't really need to say very much about myself, um, uh, except I think myself and Christy, uh, started this project uh, back in 2018. Uh, it started as a little um, 
pilot study, we had identified a gap in provision at Oxford Brooks and we wanted to explore what students thought about it and how they thought we might be able to address it. Um, Christy, is there anything else you want to say in terms of introduction to yourself? Um, no, I think um, only my other experience is as an independent sexual violence advisor supporting children and young people who've experienced sexual harm and domestic abuse. And it's really great to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, so I, I would say that uh, as a result of this initial little pilot, I mean, we, work, we only work with a very small number of first and second year undergraduate students um, to explore the possibility of developing provision and what they would like us to, to develop. And the findings of that I presented to our, one of our vice chancellors uh, for student and staff experience, and she asked me to present it to a university wide um, committee. Uh, it, the committee is called the Quality and Learning Infrastructure Committee, and they invited us to develop this project over um, three to five years. So it was it, it kind of started from very small beginnings. Um, but I think the only reason that we were able to get it off the ground was by having uh, uh, what, by it being legitimised and us giving uh, being given a particular remit from the university itself and from senior members of staff. Um, these are our general aims for the um, for the project, and these came from Kulik actually from from the uh, university committee. They wanted us to begin by creating an online resource for students to ensure equal access to high quality content. We recognise that online materials uh, only go so far as a preventative measure, um, and we recognise that this is always intended to be our starting point. It's definitely not our finishing point. It's only one of various things that we do within this project. Um, but we have been working on these online materials uh, over a period of time. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. Um, additional aims really is about uh, um, raising awareness of the importance of sexual consent education and consent, actually, not just sexual consent education, but consent uh, more broadly as well. And to in, it support staff and students to be responsible for generating a safe campus environment. So it's very much positioned from a university perspective uh, and the cons that go out about this uh, is very much about staff and students contributing to the community but also taking responsibility for themselves uh, and in that sense we are seeking to change the culture at our university we recognize that we have um, um, you know high levels of misogyny on uh, as <laughs> as universities do uh, across the UK um, but at least it's a it's an opportunity for us to acknowledge and to actively change work towards changing this um, the modules themselves, so we have, we've worked with an outside agent, it's a, an organisation called Brook Young People, they are a UK charity that support um, young people's sexual health, uh, and they designed, it was actually came out of a PhD study, and was designed in collaboration with young people, um, they have five online modules, which we we license from them, so we we um, pay for them uh, on an annual basis, and they address uh, definitions of consent, the law, uh, myths and ambiguities, how to talk about consent without um, 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 uh, upsetting the mood, and also uh, support and guidance. And that last module is geared specifically to Ox Oxford Brooks and the Oxford Brooks community. Um, they are interactive. They are uh, actually they're really great. We we trialed them with our students um, before we took them on board. Um, and there's all of the students who engaged with them. We had 100 percent who said that they thought we should take these particular modules on board. And uh, I think it was 90 percent who thought that they should be mandatory from from the off go, which was quite an interesting statistic. Um, so we've been working on how we package and present these modules to students over the last two years, um, and we have been working towards mandating the modules, which will happen from September 2023. This has been quite a long process um, and is really something that we are, we're taking the lead from students. Students want this to happen, so it's not something we're imposing, it's something that we are, we're listening and we are 
co-creating and we're talking with students about what they want. Um, and, and a big part of that is the work that we do with the Brooks Union. So our student union is very closely connected to the work that we're doing and they are also lobbying. Uh, on behalf of students for this to happen. Um, a lot of the work that we've done over the last couple of years has been about positioning these uh, uh, in a trauma-informed way uh, and placing the survivor first. And so in terms of mandating the modules, the expectation for students will be that they will have to go to an online site to access the modules, but at the point at access, they are given the option to opt in or to opt out. Um, nobody would be asked to complete the modules if it was going to be detrimental in any way, shape or form, if it was going to trigger or, 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 or be difficult for them in any way. And so for those who do opt out, there's an opportunity for them to indicate why they're opting out in a very quick tick box way and for them to indicate if they need additional support and we can monitor all of this information behind the scenes and track and contact these individuals and provide additional support for them. Everybody else is expected to complete the modules. They will be given from September, they will be given a full semester in order to complete so that people have time to decide how they want to engage with the modules. And we have provided the content of the modules in alternative formats. So for example, this year we, we had a student who approached us who wanted to access the information as a PDF so that she could talk it through with her counsellor before deciding whether or not it was an appropriate content for her to engage with. Um, additionally, we've created a centralized web page. You can see the web link up on the on the, the site there on the on the slide. We do have social media comms that go through different channels, both in terms of the main university comms and also through our Brooks Union comms. We've developed a webinar series. Um, our last webinar was a, a couple of weeks ago and it was looking at positive masculinities. And these are designed as spaces to open up quite difficult conversations. We encourage experts. So we, we often have experts who come in from outside of the university to sit on these panels, but also, staff and students uh, are also represented on these these webinars uh, and all of the recordings are uploaded to our web page and the students often engage with them after the after the event they can access them you, you can access them there too if you would like to see the kind of work that we're doing um, we have a range of in-person events um, including we have a presence at our Freshers' Fair, which is kind of induction for new students in September. We run a November roadshow where we go across all of our campuses. We have five different campuses um, and that kind of works towards a, a celebration of International Day of Consent, which is on the 30th of November. Uh, and we're developing new, we're opening up new opportunities for uh, online events, for example, working more closely with campus safety, looking at how we can have a better uh, uh, presence at uh, student induction, and also as open days so that we are available to talk to parents too about the work that we're doing. Um, we are... Uh, uh, provide uh, a range of, we have provided a range of support for students. We're in the middle of, of, of a change in relation to that at the moment. We've lobbied for an independent sexual violence advisor to be employed by the university, which we're in the process of, she, they are about to be employed. They have just recruited somebody. So we're, our, our support for students is in a little bit of transition at the moment, but hopefully it will become much more stable and much more consistent for students. Christy has done a lot of work with students, which has been fantastic. Um, uh, uh, but having somebody employed on a full time basis also provides opportunity for support for staff as well. And we are also in the process of developing a bystander um, pilot and a, a pilot uh, with staff as well to support staff to engage with the content. Um, uh, these are these are very much ongoing at the moment. In terms of responsibilities, um, from my perspective as the project lead, there are certain things that I have to lead. So we have a strategy group meeting once a fortnight uh, for an hour and everybody who is a key stakeholder is part of that strategy group. So myself and Christy, um, I have a couple of colleagues who are actually in the audience and uh, uh, here today who were part of the strategy group. So we have Elise, who's our, our comms uh, manager. We have um, somebody who's an IT specialist. 
we have a project assistant, we have um, Sarah, who's a student experience uh, um, fellow, who's also an academic, she's an academic in public health, and Sarah's here with us today as well. Um, and we have our colleagues from the Brooks Union, and we also have several student representatives, uh, and uh, some of those are paid and some of them aren't. Uh, so we provide opportunity for people who may want to volunteer and participate. And we think it's really important that we, within the strategy group, that we're able to capture a range of voices uh, and that a range of different experiences from across the university come together in order to steer the project. Um, but we also have a steering group which meets once or twice a semester, and those are um, uh, 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 allies from both staff, students and Brooks Union groups who come together and critique what we're doing and give us a steer and help us to um, analyze some of the content that we're, 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 we might be struggling with. Uh, and we provide them with an opportunity to get involved with us and, and to support us as well. Um, we work with a huge number of different colleagues across the university. It's really complicated work and really we need to work with people at a very high level. So I, uh, the project is overseen by a member of our vice chancellor group and another member of the vice chancellor group who is in charge of kind of student, a, a lot of the kind of student functions, the um, uh, student well-being, looking after the tech, all of these kind of functions that happen at a very high level within the university, we have a, we have to communicate with them as well. And we are working in collaboration with them at the moment in order to make the modules mandatory because that involves quite a lot of complexity in terms of student, um, the pragmatics of how we're going to do that. Um, we work with our EDI groups, so our equality, diversity and inclusion groups. We work with student support coordinators who are designed to support students specifically. They're not academic staff. They are professional staff who support students. We work with induction staff. We work with occupational health. We work with HR and we also present to our vice chancellor group. So it's very high level work. It, it, you know, thinking about how it fits in with the other P's, we are supporting the generation of policy through the work that we do. And that touches on, you, you know, that touches on provision of services, it touches on protection and it touches on partnerships. So I wouldn't see this as, as something that we, we do in isolation. It's very much part of a much bigger conversation. Uh, and we've just developed a gender-based violence strategy group, which is a university-wide group, which supports academics, researchers, professional staff, students, Brooks Union, external consultants, all sorts of people who are interested and involved in conversations about gender-based violence from a whole range of different perspectives across the university. We're now beginning to meet and talk, which is which is ex an exciting development and, and the consent work is central to that. Um, in terms of capacity and resources, so I have to apply for an annual budget. Um, uh, it's very small, it's less than 20 grand a year. Um, however, my uh, I, I, some of my time is paid for, so I, uh, I currently have a, a day and a half to work on this. A, a, a week and that is paid for by uh, the vice chancellor group um, uh, the budget pays for Christie's time it also pays for Sarah's time and it pays for a project assistant as well and it pays for our involvement with a range of different um, partners and it pays for our comms it we really do it on a shoestring budget we have very little um, we do work with quite a good range of external consultants uh, uh, and with expert groups, and we always try to bring in expertise um, where we don't have it. Uh, uh, we see that as absolutely crucial. Um, we, uh, I don't, I'm trying to think if there's, oh, occupational health is important because we need, we found, we realized very soon, very quickly, that actually there were members of our strategy team who had the potential that who were getting triggered by some of the content. And so we negotiated with our occupational health team for everybody to have access to um, uh, quarterly. So every three months, they have an opportunity to get in touch with a, with a specialist to actually 
operates externally from the university to talk about their experiences of the project or anything that they want to talk about. And equally, anybody who, who needs immediate support is able to access that through occupational health. Um, uh, and I think that was really, that was really crucial to ensure the safety and security of everybody who's working on the project. Um, I, I'm, I don't think I need to, there's a lot of the stakeholders I've already mentioned here. Um, we have, we work quite closely with uh, the University of Oxford um, because we share a lot of the concerns about the city and the safety, the safety and security for the students. So we've worked closely with the, um, with, with their, their union, with their student union. Um, we invite them along to our webinars and they participate and we've had several meetings with professionals who work at Oxford University um, behind the scenes so that we can share good practice and uh, and that's a really even though our systems are very different it's very beneficial um, for us to have a much wider conversation about what's happening in the city. Um, we also have a colleague at the University of Northampton who is doing some really superb work at, at the University of Northampton, and she is acting more like a critical friend for us. Uh, and we we kind of again, we're sharing uh, practice and we're supporting each other with the work that we're doing. I've, we find that really useful. Um, we're working with so Ozark, it, it, it stands for Oxford, Oxford Shears um, Sexual abuse and rape and crisis center um, and so our when our ISVO is employed they will be based at Ozark uh, so that they are working with other uh, uh, ISVAs and then they but their capacity will specifically be for our university so they will be based at Ozark but they will work with us um, and we also have a whole range of different associate college partners and school partnerships that we include in the work that we do to support a, an earlier conversation about this before young people get to the get to university. I'm going to hand over to Christy, who's going to talk about intersectionality. Thank you, Rachel. So as Rachel said, at the start of this work, we completed a feasibility study to see if students felt there was a need for sexual consent education. In the first workshop, we had all white middle class feminist students. At that point, we were very aware we needed to engage with a wider, more representative selection of students. Therefore, when it came to our second round of workshops, when we were reviewing the modules developed by Brooke Young People, we changed our comms approach and we managed to recruit a very diverse range of students, many international, some men and non-binary students. The outcome of this workshop was amazing. Students fed back that the modules themselves did not include enough diverse representation. We spoke to Brooke Young People and apparently we were the first institution to question the representation of people in the modules. Brooke Young People appreciated the feedback and changed the names of some of the people in the scenarios so that the situations were less heteronormative and changed some of the photos using the modules so they were more diverse. Within the webinars we've delivered, we've tried to offer intersectional topics and questions and a diverse representation of panel guests. However, this has not always been an easy task and moving forward, we're in the process of developing an EDI checklist for events and we are also developing an inclusion of intersectionality in our terms of reference. Um, so in terms of, um, I'm just gonna move, hang on. Uh, in terms of guidance for others, um, I, I would say that it's important that, uh, you have that the that the project is legitimized by people at the top of the university. The senior leaders really need to legitimize the work and they need to be really visible in doing that. It's not enough just to kind of uh, uh, indicate to the strategy group that you can go ahead and do stuff. We want them on comms. We want them talking to students. We want them really visibly supporting the work that we're doing. However, it's important that they are not dictating what we're doing. Okay, so it's important that they support us, but it's really important that we are talking with people that this impacts so that we work closely with students, that we work closely with, with our, our student union in order to nurture kind of co-created partnerships between staff and students. Uh, and so that we can, I think Christy will say a little bit about this as well, we want to be more engaged with survivor and survivor voice than we have been up to this point. But where we have, it's been absolutely invaluable in shaping the work that we've done. 
Um, and in that sense, it's really important that we nurture relationships and that we take the time to listen. Uh, and that, that I can't stress that enough. A lot of the work that I do involves listening to other people and allowing, allowing space for us to unpack the difficulties of the work that we're doing. We can't make rash judgments or, or quick decisions. Sometimes these things need to be debate, debated over quite a period of time to make sure that we're all very happy with, with what we're doing and how we're going to move forward and that we are being absolutely trauma informed in everything that we're doing. Um, uh, Christy, is there anything that you want to you, you'd like to add? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, in regards to what we would do differently, um, if I could start this project again from the beginning, I'd embed survivor victim survivor expertise visibly from the very start. However, I'm very aware that that process of including expertise by experience um, can be very time consuming and an expensive process and we need to ensure that those providing the victim survivor expertise are compensated for their time and benefit from access to clinical supervision and ultimately the work completed with them is delivered in a safe and trauma-informed way. I um, would also ensure that clinical supervision from occupational health is available from the very start. That was definitely an error like something we've definitely learned early on we should have put that in at the very beginning and finally um, would have developed a better relationship with the university's comms team from the very start um, however I cannot see this as being possible as the comms had a financial cost and at first we didn't have funding for comms so it's it was just really hard to work out we needed comms but we didn't have funding for it so I'd suggest anybody else starting this project to just get funding from comms for the very beginning. Thanks Christy. Um, in terms of our challenges and obstacles, God, there's been so many. <laughs> it's weird. The whole thing has been complicated right from the word go and continues to be. Um, I, I think that the, it, it has been complicated by the fact that uh, uh, getting the university to acknowledge uh, issues of gender based violence has been um, and uh, has been difficult. But that is that that is now changing which is great. Uh, I, I think we've, um, we're beginning to, we're having much more open conversations. I'm invited to some quite strategic meetings and we have a voice in a way that we didn't before, but we had to work very hard to get that voice. Um, uh, and I think it's really important that you have, you've nurtured those good relationships with senior leaders. Uh, I think it's really important that um, you support colleagues to understand what trauma-informed practice is, because even where we're working with colleagues who are in, you know, student welfare, or they may be working in terms of report and support and supporting and um, um, uh, uh, and protection, that there are, especially from kind of intersectional perspectives, there are things that they may not understand. Uh, uh, in that are specific to gender based violence. Um, so kind of supporting staff to understand potential bias is really is is critical, but really difficult. Um, and uh, I, I suppose in terms of um, uh, getting students to engage as well is actually quite difficult. Christy, is there anything you want to say about that? Yeah, I think that was, that's just a really hard process like advertising the modules at Freshers Day and things like that having that awareness that any student you might approach could be could be a victim survivor so it's about approaching those students in a very trauma informed way gaining consent to speak to them about the consent modules um and yeah just it's just a long process everything takes a bit longer I think than you would hope it would kind of thing yeah. it really does <laughs> It really does. Um, in terms of monitoring and evaluating, we had, so Brooks Union did a, a really big survey of student, um, capturing student voice and student experience of campus safety last academic year. And that has really informed, it's helped us, it's, it's helped us lobby um, uh, our vice chancellor group and to begin to develop some really significant change. So ha capturing student voice, uh, and capturing student voice on mass is be, has been really important. Um, we have, uh, as an academic, I have um, developed several of the 
pieces of work and Sarah is doing so as well as research, as academic research. So we have uh, ethical approval to capture data. And so we, we do capture data through focus group interviews with students and staff uh, about various aspects of the project. Um, uh, when we first introduced the online modules, we asked students to complete uh, an online questionnaire, which was really useful. Uh, and I think we, we're definitely going to need to monitor that very carefully as we move into mandating the modules from September. And we do, we do, we are aware of kind of the data uh, from our audiences, uh, 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 how many people we get coming to the webinar. Our last webinar was the best attended. We had over 50 people who signed up, which is amazing. So thinking about, um, you know, uh, uh, the reach of, uh, of the work that we're doing and how many people from outside of the university are beginning to engage with it. Um, in terms of the sustainability of, of the work, I mean, it, it, of course, it's important that, that senior leaders buy into it, but they have to, it, it's important that they are still willing to pay for it. So, it, you know, having that annual budget, albeit a very small annual budget, is absolutely crucial for sustaining this work. Without that, it wouldn't really happen. What's quite useful for us at the moment in the UK is that the Office for Students, which is a government organisation, um, they have, last year they released uh, a series of expectations that every university had to follow in relation to gender-based violence. And um, we're in the process of consulting with them about how we present the prevention materials and uh, uh, how we make our provision really explicit to our students. And so we've been consulting on that. So having opportunity to contribute to things that actually have quite big national implications and government and policy implications really helps to sustain the work as well. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna leave it there because I think we ran over, I'm really sorry about that. Um, but that's it. We're finished. Thank you very much, uh, both Rachel and uh, Christy, for your presentation.